It's so great to see you. This is our missions luncheon. We have two going on, and we're going live stream into the uh, Sweet 15. And it's our great joy to have our executive director of National World Missions. Will you give it up for my friend, our friend, John Easter, as he comes to share with us today. John, welcome to NCAG. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to be here with Rick and Susan, who we admire deeply. I know you're losing them in some ways, but you always have them. And uh, congratulations as well to everything else that's happened. It's fantastic. What an amazing district. I was looking at your history of the sending potential and what you've done historically. And we want to say thank you for the amazing individuals that are serving across the fields that have come straight out of the local churches in NCAG. And uh, I, what I thought I would do for a moment is, is uh, number f first of all, I want to recognize my wife, Cheryl, because I'm in a better mood today because she's with me. Yeah. How's that? Isn't that awesome? So, yeah, you'll see the better part of me. This, what I want to do, though, is I want to give you a 30,000-foot view of Assemblies of God World Missions in terms of size and scale, because I think that that's really important for you as lead pastors and if you're ministry leaders, because probably if you're here today, then there's something about your leadership within this network, and there's very few in our movement that really don't wave the flag in terms of our Assemblies of God World Missions footprint somewhere. And so we want to say thank you for that. So let me kind of walk through that. I think that's the best thing I could provide for you during this luncheon, and I think it will inspire your hearts. So the first thing is, uh, you may not know this, but if we were to look at this, this world map, like the one behind me, and the one that was there, guys, so in that global presence, the United Nations, IMF, identify about 192 countries of the world. And what's interesting about that is, is that as of today, we are in serving in 153 nations and many locations within those uh, geographical national boundaries. Can you say, man, isn't that powerful? So what's interesting about that is, is that as of yesterday, we now have 2,699 missionaries around the world somewhere. So over 2,699 missionaries. And so, and we can go to that, guys. <laughs> so every 30 seconds now, we find that because of not just nationals who are reaching those within their communities that we have invested in, where we've planted churches, formed them into national churches, but through our missionaries, every 30 seconds, a new believer is added to the church. They come to faith for the very first time. And that's an average over the last 10 years. Can you imagine that? So just over the last 10 years, we have seen this and been able to track it. So it goes anywhere between 30 to 32 seconds, we're able to see someone come to Christ for the very first time as Lord and Savior. And what's exciting about that is, is that every 66 minutes, a new church is planted through our efforts somewhere in the world before and someplace in location prior to where there was no church. So what's powerful about this is, is that we're aligned with our mission, what God's called us to do, and North Carolina is a huge part of that. So in 110 years, we turned 110 years as a fellowship last month, and 110 years of our movement, what's exciting about this is, is that we have now planted just through directly our missionary efforts over 383,000 and over 700 local churches worldwide. Hallelujah. Isn't that powerful? So this is a direct ROI based on the 110 years of investment that we've made together. And just notice how many people are part of our movement. This is now nearly 56 million people that have come into our fellowship worldwide that, that somewhere worship in our churches. So this 56 million is an interesting figure because what this really looks at is, is that in two months, we're going to be increasing this figure. I've held this back both under Greg Mundus when I served him because I was looking at all of our stats and what we were happening strategically and the way we were positioned worldwide. But in, in two months, we will raise this up and we'll be well over 86 million people worldwide. Can you imagine that? It's just phenomenal what's happening. And these are conservative statistics. 
Our mission, as you well know, is to establish the church among all peoples everywhere. And we take that very seriously. So, so we'll talk about some of this for just a moment. I want to talk about some priorities going forward. The first thing is, is that you need to know that all of that data that you just saw, the 2,699 the 153 nations out of 192 that are recognized by the United Nations. The stats of how many people are coming to faith and churches planted, which is an incredible, I think, data point that we have to know if we're hitting our marks there. What's interesting is, is that all of that is because we're mandated by you to be able to establish the church among all peoples. And because of that, we find that in that 110-year trajectory, we have not drifted. So this is really important for you to probably understand. As of right now, this month, we are the fifth largest sending agency, not in evangelical missions, but in Protestant missions. And within five years, if our data continues to show and reflect that we're growing, our acceleration continues at the pace it is now, then we will certainly move to a much more prominent position. And already our footprint is quite large. So I just want you to consider that for a moment. So whether you've been part of the Assemblies of God in our fellowship in this network for generations, or whether you're coming in and you've just been newly credentialed and you are now finding this tribe to be the tribe that God's called you to be part of, this is very significant because this speaks to the very DNA, the identity and purpose behind so much of how we see ourselves, Both locally and globally, we are a church planning movement. And so what's interesting about this is, is that this is very significant in the time in which we live, knowing that as we look at Protestant and evangelical churches and denominations and fellowships in the Western world, not just in the United States, we have seen that for whatever reason, and a lot of that, I think, is just the Holy Spirit continuing to speak and direct and guide our steps. And we have found ways to pivot when we begin to offset is that we are now continuing the joys and the benefits of staying true to what God raised us up to do. And my plea would be for all of us who are in the room that are part of my generation and younger, that this is ex incredibly important for us to be able to keep this principle in mind. Because Assemblies of God World Missions now is having an impact around the world, even among other denominations. For example, in Africa, 70% of men and women who are credentialed with the Anglican Church have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Much of that has been influenced by Assemblies of God World Missions. And that goes unreported. But can you imagine the influence? So if today we're beginning to see mission drift hugely in denominations, I mean, United Methodist is all over the headlines. If you see this in PCA, Presbyterian PCUSA, if you see this, for example, in the Episcopal Pagan Church, which has been happening for generations now in their drift, what's interesting is the Assemblies of God, which was born 110 years ago, coming from the other side of the tracks where very few people gave in consideration to our influence in society, what has happened now is God has now put us and positioned us into an incredible place of influence. And the question is, is how will we steward this moving forward? Because yes, right. if you think we're immune to what everyone else is walking through, well, don't be naive. <laughs> so what we find is, is that we are in an incredible strategic position and so this moment that we have even in this luncheon reminds us that, that what we need is not just mission updates and project updates. These are the moments that define who we are going forward. Stewarding this moment and the moment to come if Jesus tarries. So let me walk you through a few priorities for the future before we transition today. And I'm just going to take probably about 15 minutes to do this, okay? And then we're going to transition. What's interesting is, is the first one is, is reaching the frontier. We have always been a frontier missions movement. And by the way, that includes here at home. So if you want to know how we spread so quickly 
in the first century, in the 20th century, is because we saw ourselves not just for those that we sent out of our local churches across cultures in other geographical places. We saw ourselves as carrying that identity and DNA at home as well. And that pioneer frontier spirit opened up new ways. And what's exciting about that is, is that we're seeing this across our fellowship again right here at home. And hopefully that spirit is being fueled for what, who we're sending out and our missionaries are coming back and stoking the fires and reminding us again, our Antioch, what it's all about, right? So this frontier mission is absolutely essential. And there's reason for this. 42% of our world remains unreached with the gospel. That means there's no access, there's no community of faith, there's no viable life-giving uh, a church. That's 42% of our population. So as of, as of yesterday, that would be about 3.4 million people. So a, a billion. So 3.4 billion people. So if you can imagine, what we've seen is is that in 200, in about 40 to 60 years of Protestant missions coming out of the Reformation period, acceleration. Then all of a sudden, the outpouring of Pentecost at Azusa and the founding of the AG, which had so much impetus upon even other denominations, acceleration. We get to the point where we get to the 1990s, deceleration. And all of a sudden, we begin to see more closures than we're opening, Right? But, all of, but now we are seeing something happening again. The trend lines are showing us not just locally, but globally, there's now another moment where we're beginning to see acceleration. The, the data points are beginning to move forward and upward once again. Isn't that exciting? So when, and when I, as the executive director of AGWM, looking at the plains of our world in the regions that exist like Africa, Europe, South, uh, Latin America, Caribbean, uh, Asia Pacific, Northern Asia, Eurasia, when we're looking at the world in all of these regions in the 192 countries that exist and all of the people groups, our concern now is to say where have we accelerated and where we have tremendous amount of saturation with church plants, but where's the segment of the world where we have very little presence? But this will, come, this will come at a new challenge for not just us, but you. And the reason I'm taking time on this is, is because the new places where, that we have our eyes on are places that are, that are very difficult, challenging, they're hard ground. And so the lessons that we learned in the very initial phases of our development as a mission sending agency, and by the way, all you have to go is back to our second general council to see our fundamental statement that we resolve to see the greatest evangelism that the world has ever seen in our original documents. Joseph Flowers, two years later, states that we do not see ourselves as an emerging fellowship, as merely a denomination for organizational management. We see ourselves, quote, as a mission sending agency. Isn't that powerful? So in 1914, 15, 17, 26, 32, 36, 45, all of this time, we're seeing this incredible doubling down in our early fathers to be able to say, this is how we see ourselves. What's interesting about this, though, is if we double down in this generation right now at your council, at this network conference, and what we're seeing is Cheryl and I are taking these tours in the 10 that we're part of this year. What's interesting is, is that we're seeing a new commitment and resolve. And I will tell you, it will come at a cost as it did the first 25 years when we lost some of our sons and daughters. What we're seeing is, is right now is new open doors in countries that have been shut to us for generations. But we also know that when those doors open, things are going to transpire. So any day I get up, and every day there's a crisis somewhere. There was one this morning. And there's someone interrogated. There's families that are separated. There are individuals who have been harmed, hijacked, shot. Something happens. It's every day. What's interesting, though, is, is that the resolve of, that we have had as a fellowship is to say, it's not enough to sing, I surrender all unless we're willing to surrender all. 
And so as I've been touring, not in the main services, but in moments like this, is to prepare us to say that when we start losing the first son and daughter in our climate, in our society today, I'm afraid that what's going to happen is, is that we're going to, we're going to lose the emotion of our earlier commitment and we're going to resolve to lawsuits. And what I want to prepare us for is as pastors, as ministry leaders, as network leaders, and as national leaders, are we really serious about frontier missions and reaching the part of the world where Christ has never been named? The second thing is missionary care. This is really close to my heart because Cheryl and I have lived through things and with our children in certain parts of Africa that we would hope that many families would not have to endure. But because we did, it just gives us this insight into what missionary families can endure and walk through. And so a lot of my time right now coming into the office is shoring up and strengthening our member care. And over the next five years, we will be taking steps of tremendous investment, which has already begun in earnest, to be able to see us do that. Because we're only, our mission is only as healthy as our missionaries that we send. And by the way, you heard me mention, this is powerful for me. You heard me mention the number of missionaries we had as of yesterday, 2,699 in 153 nations. That does not include the 1,456 missionary kids that are on those fields today as well. Isn't that awesome? So what's happening is, is that we as a movement, it's not just AGWM that celebrates that. That's something you should be celebrating to the rooftops because these individuals come out of your churches. And what's powerful about it is, is that we have recently, with all of our leadership, called them into planting the church with renewed spirit. So planting the church is absolutely essential to where we're going. You see, if our mission is to establish the church among all peoples everywhere, then planting the church is something that is really critical to us as well. And that is essential because... For example, look at your own network conference. I love sitting in the back at the very moment, last moments of that, of that business session, and I heard that financial report as to the, what I look for is, what's the church planning fund look like? In any network I go to, I say, what does their church planning fund look like? A budget is a theological document to me, and it shows you where your theological priorities are. <clears throat> So every time I'm with one of my leaders in a region or with one of my leaders on an area or field level and I want to know what those priorities are, I say, okay, give me your budget as well. Let me see if there's alignment here. By the way, if you're a lead pastor in here, you should do the same thing with the departments of your church. And so here, planning the church is really important to AGWM. So if you are a pastor or a network leader here and you have a missionary please ask them to say in everything that you do, whether you're in construction or children's ministry, whether you happen to be in youth ministry or training, whatever it may be, how do you draw a line to the establishing of churches? Because we are not a missions organization that just does shotgun to say, if you just feel called, we facilitate anyone's call, no matter what you want to do. Well, that's not true. If it is, we're going to end up having drift at some point. What we want to say is, is no, we're mandated by you, our fellowship, to establish the church among all peoples everywhere. And we do this by reaching frontier. We do this by planting the church, training up national leaders, and through serving with compassion. And you can be involved in any of those areas, but at the end of the day, if it's divorced from helping to establish churches, then we don't do that. Do you hear my heart? That's really important. Because, you know, there are a million orphanages in the world. And I meet with a lot of their leaders that end up in trouble. And they want us to help bail them out. And I'll say, well, what church are you connected with? And they'll say, well, we just are independent and stand on our own. And said, that's the problem. 
We love children, we love compassion, we love service, we love water, we love equipping, we love construction. But at the end of the day, and listen pastors, at the end of the day, what's interesting is, is that we don't do missions just to be another charitable organization. And here's why this is important. Because there are a thousand of them that have more resources and are larger than we are and do it better than we do, but they don't care anything about planting the church. Why would we abdicate the one thing we do better than they all do? Okay, so, all right, so now you know where I'm putting in my leadership mark. We need to hear this today. And as lead pastors in the room, you need to hear this. So, so I'm going to stop and not go with the other points here. I'm going to stop here because I think I need to say this because I have you captive for two more minutes. <laughs> when you're thinking about your missions budget, here's what I would do. Because I was a pastor for 10 years and I loved it. We're still close to that local congregation. But nobody taught me anything about missions strategically where I could know how to invest. I went with what moved my heart at the moment. And some of it was good and some of it didn't have very much impact. One of the things I would do is I would look at everything that you support. I'd look at the missionaries that you support and the areas that they're involved in. I would look at the projects that you support and what that means. And then funnel that down into Pioneer Missions. How much of what you do does frontiers, evangelism? How much is really planting the church? How much is equipping and training nationals to raise up that generation for sustainability? And how much of it is compassion, which is critical too? But how is all of it linked to that? And be able to sit down within those quadrants and say, okay, what does that really mean? Because if you're 80% in some other one, that might be a problem. Because at the end of the day, the only reason you saw these numbers up there, the only reason that was possible is because of the fact that we said we're for all of it, but we're for none of it if it's not tethered to the church. It must be tethered to the church. And I'm speaking the language of church planners in here and pastors. But we as pastors are the first ones to actually violate how we invest. And it's not because we don't care. And you forgive me, please. It's because we're not thoughtful. Oh boy, you'll never invite me back here. I'm so sorry. Are you with me? Like this is really, inco- this is really, really important. This is really important because what we've learned in Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu, secular societies today is that you can pour millions of dollars into ministry, but if you don't start with the church and tether it to the church, it it doesn't sustain itself. I'm done. Uh, John, I, I, in the last few minutes, actually in the last couple hours, my life has taken a real shift because all of a sudden, uh, I feel like it's really important that you should be praying for your leaders. <clears throat> I've never felt it so intensely in my entire life. And uh, as, I was, as I was sitting there, suddenly it, it settled on me almost like a mantle settling on my, uh, a sense settling on my shoulders that... Um, we should be praying for you. And uh, Sherry and I are thinking about Moon and Lindsay Choi, our son-in-law, our daughter, and our three babies on the field in the Philippines right now. And uh, I'm looking up here at you and I'm saying, how come I'm not praying for that guy every day? Because I, I realized in that moment, I was kind of jerked awake that you know, God has put you in such a 
pivotal place, such an important place. And I just think that as we bring this to a close and at 1.30, we're going to be starting business. And Pastor Rick has already let me know we're not starting business at 1.31. 1.30, we're going to be voting. So uh, we're going to be a little pushed. But we have time. We have time just to ask the Lord for our leader in the DNA of who we are as the Assemblies of God. I mean, you talk about someone who is embedded now in the DNA of who we are, that we just need to pray. We need to pray for him. So would you, would you just raise your voice? You're Pentecostal people. You know how to pray. Would you just raise your voice with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for John and Cheryl, that you have placed them where you have placed them for such a time as this. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wisdom you have given them, for the oversight, O oh Lord, that you have placed upon them. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gifts that they possess, but even more so for their absolute dependence on you and for your spirit. We pray for our missions family all over the world, but specifically, we are praying for those who are in leadership, making decisions on a daily basis that affect the field. We pray as our hearts have been challenged today, that we would be, rem that we would be reminded, always mindful, always purposeful, always thoughtful about the fact that we are a missionary organization that was raised up in the power of Pentecost to go change the world. And so, Father, as our brother is on the tip of the spear now, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless him abundantly and use him, Lord, even beyond what he has asked or what he has imagined. And we ask it all in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. We want you to know, we want you to know that you have exactly 19 minutes to enjoy yourself. And then we're going to work. So we will see you. Uh, thank you so much. Would you just, would you just show your appreciation? God bless you.